Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to be with y'all. I'm very honored and privileged to be in this particular space. Um, I really love the idea of this show, getting to consider our influences. Um, and a lot of the work I do facilitating space for youth is asking them the question, you know, um, you know, what's influenced you? How did you get here? How did you get to this room? Um, I'm sure we all have a whole bunch of stories, and I'm going to get to share some stories with y'all. How I got to this room. So, y'all seen that? Um, I first found him when I was 15. I just moved to Los Angeles from Virginia. Found him in Best Buy um, for about ten dollars, um, and I knew he was a conscious rapper. Although I didn't really know what conscious meant at the time, I think I have a little more perspective of what that means. Um, He's a rapper who's very critical of rapping, of hip hop, of society, and where he fits in society, and where folks like us fit in society. Um, and let's see, what else do you need to know? Um, he's very prominent in the 1990s, still doing his thing, and it's been really exciting for me just to see him evolve over time um, as I've grown into adulthood. And he was in a group called Black Star mm -hmm. with Talib Kweli, um, another prominent New York, Brooklyn MC. And yeah, his first album was called Black on Both Sides. So that is all you need to know. Um, and here, um, actually, I was like, what would be a cool way to like, introduce y'all to some of his work? So I printed out some of his lyrics. I was thinking of y'all. I um, typed them up and printed them out for y'all. Um, and I'm going to bust them. So <laughs> yeah. here we go. Yes. And this is from the song Thieves in the Night. One of, this is my favorite hip hop song of all time. Like it's so, starting with the chords. Not strong, only aggressive, not free. We only licensed, not compassionate, only polite. Now who the nice is not good, but well behaved. Chasing after death so we can call ourselves brave. Still living like mental slaves. Hiding like thieves in the night from life. Illusions of oasis making you look twice. Hiding like thieves in the night from life, illusions of oasis making you look twice. I'm sure that everybody out listening agree that everything you see ain't really how it be. A lot of jokers out running in place chasing the style. Be a lot going on beneath the empty smile. Most cats in the area be loving the hysteria. Synthesized service conceals the interior. America, land of opportunity, mirages and camouflages. More than usually, speaking loudly, saying nothing. You confusing me, you losing me, your game is twisted. Want me enlisted in the usury. Foolishly, most men join the ranks cluelessly, buffoonishly, except the deception, believe the perception, reflection rarely seen across the surface of the looking glass, walking down the street, wondering who they be looking past, looking gas with them imported designer shades on, stars shine bright but the light rarely stays on, same song, just remix, different arrangements, put you on a yacht but they won't call it a slave ship, strangeness, you don't control this, you barely hold this, screaming brand new when they just sanitize the old shit, suppose this, just another clever Jedi mind trick that they've been running across stars through all the time with, I find Find it distressing, there's never no in-betweens. We either niggas or kings, we either bitches or queens. The deadly ritual seems immersed in the perverse. Full attention, full of short attention spans, short tempers and short skirts. Long barrel automatics released in short bursts. The length of black life is treated with short words. Get yours first, them other niggas secondary. That type of ill and that be filling up the cemetery. This life is temporary, but the soul is eternal. Separate the real from the lie. Let me learn you're not strong, only aggressive, because the power ain't directed. That's why we are subjected to the will of the oppressive, not free. We only license, not live. We just exciting because the captors own the masters to what we write. We're not compassionate, only polite. We well trained. Our sincerity's rehearsed in stage. It's just a game, not good, but well behaved because the camera survey. Most of the things that we think, do, or say, we chasing after death just to call ourselves brave. But every day, next man, meet with the grave. I give a damn if any fan recall my legacy. I'm trying to live life in the sight of God's memory like that, y'all. <laughs> um, so how often do you go to a reading and get rap sung at you? Um, it's okay, okay. Make noise, a clap, and nod your head, it's all right. Um, I give you all the permission to do that. I know um, silence is a form of showing politeness, but um, for folks who haven't been to a spoken word event before, um, I'm going to do some spoken word poetry for you. Um, you are totally encouraged to respond um, live in the moment, here with me. Because um, when I hear you, it gets me really excited. And then I start getting excited too. And we get to share that energy with each other. So 
shake it out. That's fine. Cool. So here's a poem um, I was very stressed out about writing. Um, it's a poem I really wanted to write for a long time, um, just trying to get under the surface of my relationship with hip-hop. Like I said, um, Mostaf is a conscious rapper. He was the first conscious rapper I really encountered that I think had me um, to kind of open up my own critical consciousness. Um, and yeah, so just getting to um, look at my own life as like a primary text and apply that critical consciousness is really exciting to get to look back at the source, you know, most depth. Um, and yeah, so this is a poem called Brooklyn in three parts. After his song called Brooklyn, which is also in three parts, on his first album, you should check it out. It is good. Okay. <laughs> One, Brooklyn. The rapper Yasin Bey says the word Brooklyn 18 times on his album Black on Both Sides. Most. By the time you spelled beat to the R, uh, the O, the O K, L Y N, on the intro to the 13th track of your first solo album, my bags were packed. I scratched it onto all of my notebooks, tagged it on the back of my homework, twisted my Virginia tongue and nasally Brooklyn and rehearsed it like a mantra, like a new name. All 18 times like Brooklyn, 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 every time I replayed your album. Even if I had only been to Brooklyn once, visiting cousins when I was seven, even if I was from Maryland, Virginia, Los Angeles, I shouted it out with you. Because Brooklyn meant New York, meant hip hop for us out of towners, meant home for us that knew more of four elements than what it was like to grow up between four walls. Who did not know what to say when somebody asked us where we were from, traveling men with roots like tumbleweeds whose parents were born in a country we have never been to, whose parents speak a language we never learned, who went to way too many high schools than we should have, who couldn't spit, DJ, b-boy, or write graffiti well but still found foundation between the boom and the bap of a hip-hop record, we just said Brooklyn. Two, definition. Audre Lorde tells me poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless. Most, you introduced me to poetry in cornrows and a white beater. I called it hip-hop, and I learned your raps like a 16-bar sonnet. I remember holding the cover of your first album like a mirror, black on both sides, even if I was half white, half Afro-Panamanian immigrant, identity was never as easy as checking a box as two sides of anything, but for the first time I considered myself a border, where two opposing forces come together like being black in America, like black star shining, collarbone raised like a black fist through your white tee. I felt solidarity in how your bones rose defiant from your chest in the 90s. Us skinny kids buried our skeletons between tall tees and jeans tied baggy round our, round our waists. Under so much fabric, you could almost forget the body beneath it. The threat carved into its skin. Self-hatred rising like smoke from every television, billboard, and mirror it peered into. This is how you'd be black in a military town in Maryland, in a segregated classroom in Virginia, in a gentrified neighborhood in Los Angeles, in post-racial America, not Brooklyn, not Harlem, Renaissance, isn't that hip hop? Three, redefinition. Most, you showed me how to be black and beautiful. Even when I misread your lyrics for months, I thought your song definition went one, two, three, most definitely live quality. We came to rock it on to the tip top, best lions in hip hop, why yo? <laughs> Heard best alliance, most deaf quali as lions, African kings, black power radiating through my speakers years later. I realized I heard right. You were lions, black mane braided behind your head now. Keep one cropped along your jawline, wisdom shining like a black star from your bald head. You call it Brooklyn. I call it self empowerment. That's why I recite it 18 times every time I play the album back. Brooklyn, like home. Brooklyn, like black. Brooklyn is beautiful. Brooklyn is power. Brooklyn is hip hop. Brooklyn is me. Uh, thank you, thank you. I heard some of y'all. There were lines you liked in that, and I felt it. Um, so, um, another thing I was doing this week in preparation for this, and I got to feature at the Berkeley Poetry Slam, um, which is a great honor. It's every week if you're in Berkeley. Um, you should check it out every Wednesday. Um, but it, these are like my first kind of major features in a few communities that I've been in, you know, in the audience. Um, and I really wanted to 
make sure that I didn't lose the opportunity to get to share with y'all more. Um, so I made chat books. Um, small collections of poetry, my first um, ever. Um, and I got a few in the back if y'all want to check them out, thumb through them. Um, it's a picture, a baby picture of me. Um, it was really cool when I was getting it printed at Copy Central. The guy was like, you look a little young to have a baby. I'm like, you are right, sir. Because <laughs> that is me. Um, and it's called When I Was. Again, just looking at life as a primary text. And um, a lot of my poems start when I was, 20 years old, you know, this and that. So here's a poem I wrote called Ten Men. Um, and again, following most staff, just black male navigating the world, critical consciousness, trying to make sense of that. Uh, a lot of my time was spent in the classroom. UC Berkeley, A. Um, just public schools my whole life, so this is that. Ten Men. Black students have long mastered speaking two languages. One comes easy from our lips, natural as syrup falling from maple trees. When we talk, our tongues smooth the edge off of a language used to condemn us. Every no turns into nah. We take boy and make it brother. Call each other son, sister. Make it feel home. Make it feel like family. The other we wear like a suit of armor. It comes sharp from our mouths, rigid in its structure, a hard edifice of polished steel melted smooth in blacksmith bodies. It emerges from a constant pounding between the anvil of our classrooms and classmates' eyes like heavy hammers, landing on our clothes, on our textbooks, on our mouths. You are not the only ones that sometimes feel like we do not belong here. We struggle to pull these mismatched pieces together. I switch black and forth so fast I get whiplash. Remember how in ninth grade classmates told me I sound black, but neighborhood friends told me I act white. How I did not yet know the meaning of words like segregation, but still tried to separate the pieces of myself along racial lines in class. I feel like a tin man in the woods, a scrap metal exorcism, junkyard ghosts, how I squeak with accidentally dropped slang when my first language refuses to sit silent and crawls up through rusted brown pipes. My first language sometimes falls from my lips natural as an axe splitting wood, but I've heard it cut the air before me to the laughter of too many full classrooms. In my fourth year of college, I've almost practiced the black out of me. Wear this language like a suit of armor I hide behind. Watch the brown of my skin disappear behind an impenetrable wall in class. I wear my face hard and unmoving like I do in the street. Hard and unmoving. A blinking wall, cold and vacant. This is how we survive in environments not built for us. Even at home, when I try to unbraid the steel from my tongue, I struggle to unhinge myself from this language. I talk to mom a pool of brown skin and sweet syrup and cringe at the click of my teeth like locked buckle and razor blade how words like colonization and historic trauma fall sharp on soft ears hard and coagulated a vile mixture maple and buzzsaw half home half academia fitting nowhere but here in my own mouth so i have one more for you yeah you can clap. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you again um, for having me here. Thank you, Natasha, for recommending me. Thanks, Terry Tappa, for recommending Natasha. Um, and for folks that are facilitating spaces like these. Um, we are in your debt. Um, and if you want to check out more of our poetry and you don't pick up a book, check out www.gabrielmcortez.com. It's a WordPress, and I just bought the um, domain name for 18 bucks a year. So let's use it. <laughs> so I'm afro Um and I've never been to Panama, but I grew up in my grandpa's house, um, who is a Afro-Panamanian man um, in every sense of the word. Um, and this is a word, this is a poem kind of talking about that experience. Um, it's called Machetes. My great-great-grandfather, oh, oh, too many greats. My great-grandfather Demas taught me how to cut grass with a machete. When I was seven, he laid the long blade into my American palms, and I felt it foreign as a language I did not understand. Still, my great-grandfather Demas ushered me into the rainforest of his backyard and taught me to swing. My great-great-grandfather's name was Machete. My grandfather tells me how Machete would offer his son Demas as bait for crocodiles, how he would usher Demas into his swamp and make him run wild through the mire. How his body awakened the ancient lizards from their mud. How their hungry jaws gave chase behind him. How Machete 
would carve the leather from their backs and sell the pieces for their survival. I do not know how many crocodiles my great-grandfather Demas has escaped in his lifetime, but I know that Demas is a snapping jaw when he is angry, when he is so loud the house shakes, when he screams like a boy running through his grandfather's swamp. I've never heard my great-grandfather Demas speak of crocodiles, but these stories my family keeps like machetes under our beds. Since I was little, I have known my grandfather to keep a machete under his bed. He tells me if anyone ever threatened our home, they would feel his machete. I know that my grandfather could kill someone if he had to. Fast and natural as he cuts mango from the tree. Fast and natural as jaws rise from the mud. Some days, my grandfather is a crocodile. I remember how at seven when I cried, he asked me, are you a faggot? Get up, get up. I remember how the word fell a heavy blade from his mouth, how it sounded like teeth snapping behind me, a wild and desperate boy running through his grandfather's swamp, how now, as a man, I recognize that some traditions are passed down in bite marks and scar tissue like. I remember how my grandmother held the floor in her arms the night she and my mother couldn't stop my grandfather and my uncle from fighting how there were two hands holding open a closing jaw, how they both bent like grass in the mouth of a hungry blade, how the house stood silent as the police took away my grandfather, how the women washed the blood from the floor behind him. I'm learning to wash the blood from the floor behind me, but it is a swamp filled with old and hungry things, a tradition that has been passed down by the men before me, a cleaver in my mouth and knuckles, hands fashioned into machetes. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.